Thank you so much for having me and thank you Sholine for that beautiful and kind introduction. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I have to say this is my first live uh, in-person talks post COVID. I did a couple 45 minutes on Zoom and this is just way better. Higher. How's that? Well, you'll see when you're back that way. Um, so I understand there's some folks on Zoom and um, I think Stacey is gonna help me try to make sure that uh, we hear their question. My general request for the group, if you don't mind, is uh, I prefer to take substantive uh, and maybe like theoretical and really in-depth or discussion-like questions at the end. If you're not understanding though what I'm doing, <laughs> I don't want you to be with me. So ask in the middle if it's like a, what's going on? And those are questions that are welcome. All right, so um, this is one of the papers from the project that Shawan mentioned. Uh, this is the most, uh, Let's say it's, it's most related to child development in the sense of a stratification outcome. She's correct that we have other health related projects and I recognize that I might be missing my audience in the sense that I'm not presenting the health papers here, but they're under review. <laughs> and I really wanted to get more feedback and I know how brilliant you are as a group of people. And so I'm hoping that as presenting a work in progress versus something either published or under review, um, we can grow and I can grow with you. So thank you. Uh, and so therefore, uh, if you have any other questions about other papers, I'm happy to share. So this is a project co-authored with my graduate student. Uh, well, he's actually not mine, but uh, I'm one of his mentors, Alex uh, Chapman, and then Kelly Davis at Oregon State. So I don't want to run out of time and miss the opportunity to thank people that are so valuable in the development of this project. Um, it's been great to hear about you guys and what y'all do. Uh, here and, and I, you know, I use it as data, but to see it like in person is pretty wild. Um, and so this project has about 20 to 30, depending on how you count data sets underneath it. Uh, and so I have done my own little acquisition <laughs> cleaning project. And so many of the people here have helped with that. Um, some in this group, oops, some in this group are, what's the problem with aging? Okay, some in this group are with actual, like they gave me access to data. Yosef Barowski is our, um, our geospatial person who helped me um, turn maps into data files. Uh, several of these folks are grad former grad students and uh, Lisa Ryan is a, our data specialist that helped me make uh, contracts to get use of data that's not normally uh, available. It's also a fairly complicated project and so I've relied on some super famous, super great experts to help make my project better. So I'm thankful to everybody here on this list. And there's many more. So, um, in many ways, this project harkens back to me as a dissertation student. I was really interested in the ways in which families uh, contributed to social stratification. And so when this opportunity of this whole magical experiment came up, while I'd been increasingly studying health, I was like, oh man, I get to go back to study some education outcomes. And so um, the understanding or the consideration and prediction of children's human capital development is a huge <laughs> scholarly enterprise that spans almost every social science discipline. Uh, I could fill your entire suite with research articles that study these associations. Uh, this is my office building. It's the tallest building on Penn State's campus with 10 floors. I think I could fill Oswald Tower with the amount of research on this topic. Um, and so it's a really high interest topic in thinking about what resources contribute to children's human capital development or their educational trajectories, if that word is a better phrase for you. To help motivate the folks in the room who are more health scholars, I would just make an argument that we see such strong gradients in health and population health outcomes by people's educational attainment that I hope to motivate you or slightly interested in this topic in the sense of thinking about that I'm really considering what leads to those educational gradients and, um, and what can we understand as the causal process by which they um, are developed. So many uh, factors could be you know, studied in thinking about education and human capital development. We could think about um, educational attainment. So like highest years of schooling, which credentials you have. I'm gonna here today focus on uh, academic achievement. These are in many ways indicators along the process of that pathway to educational attainment. These are indicators about children's test scores. I'm gonna focus here on English language arts and math. Um, and it's been, it's often studied because it's often seen as a critical pathway uh, to the process by who goes to college or who ends up getting a college degree. 
The key thing that's interesting is in the last several decades in the United States, we now see that the achievement gap, meaning the difference between the average test score, oh, my eyes, <laughs> these help me see you, but I can't see here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to need bifocals. <laughs> Fine. Um, in other words, what the gap is measuring is like say the average uh, test score, say for group I, for, uh, relative to the average for group J. And what we have here is more explanation on the Y axis is what we're looking at the average difference in the standardized test scores and the income gap, which is here in black, is the gap between, if you will, for group I, families at the 90th uh, percentile of the income distribution relative to the families who are at the 10th percentile of the income distribution. And so we're looking at their children's test scores in the 90th relative to the children's test scores at the 10th. Whereas this dotted line is the difference in the, in the computation is of the, the gap in average test score for uh, black or uh, African-American relative to whites. And what we can see in this graph is over time and historically, we've had a rise in the income gap in, in test scores and a decline in the test score gap by race. Um, they're here only showing the, the information by black white test scores, but we can also see it with other comparisons to white racial groups. And so it's not uh, without um, notice that this rise in the income uh, test score gap coincides with the dramatic rise of income inequality in the United States. While we had simultaneous at least legal progress on some of our uh, like you know, access options for educational opportunities uh, and more progress legally for black white. Um, disparities. So the, the now the uh, income uh, test score gap is five times the size of the black white test score gap. Um, I put, put this in fourth, but it's also worth noting that the gap in college attendance for high children from high income families relative to low income families has grown. Uh, and also the uh, achievement of a college degree has grown between those from the top relative to the bottom. And Increasingly, scholars are trying to understand why and what's undergirding this. Um, while I am a family scholar, I do think there's many and multiple sources. It's unlikely, however, this is related to uh, K through 12 policy and procedures. And the key, uh, one of the key explanations for this is that we see, again, it's that same uh, 90th to 10th, 90th to 10th percent percentile uh, information, but now we have with a cohort of the Eccles K, and we start with fall kindergarten and move forward. And we see that the, the gap basically is already present at kindergarten. And it remains relatively flat, uh, though there is some slight increase over the third grade through eighth grade. So people are um, you know, continuing to focus on educational policy practices, what teachers do and so forth, uh, what curriculum are available, how it is structured, uh, funding and, and interest in the school process. Don't get me wrong, that's really good stuff. Uh, but with the evidence that it's also present quite early, people are thinking through what are families doing and how are they operating and raising their children differently, uh, even before school begins. So that's where I come into the play, because that's one of my fields of interest. But we see these associations between you know, much higher test scores for the highest income families or children from the highest income families relative to the children from the 10th percentile. But is it truly causal? So this project began in collaboration with economists and the economists, and, and my apologies if I offend anyone, they're like, of course income matters, right? Um, and I was like, I'm not so sure. And in so many ways, I was the skeptic in the room. And in part, because I'm not sure really if it's a causal relationship, because I guess, frankly, as a status attainment scholar <laughs> coming out of Wisconsin, I see income as the end of a very long process. So what if you were just measuring say the correlation between a, the end of a very long stratification process with another one occurring with children. So I wasn't entirely sure it was causal. But is the cash question in the room? And for many policy analysis, it's the thing that I think they have more leverage on, right? There could be a way in which we shift uh, family supports, change EITC benefits or do something. And we don't often have policy conversations around implementing uh, an experiment to say change parents' education, right? So this is often seen as while not very feasible, maybe it's more on the table or at least discussed more often sometimes. But is it actually causal? Well, there's some literature and we can see this is that the you know, children who are raised in more uh, high income families, they often have more resources for the intellectual and cognitive stimulation. So whether it's the purchase of books 
or the purchase of extracurricular activities, tutoring, um, maybe it's um, the engagement in extracurricular camps or summer activities, or just the frequency of reading. I'm sure you've heard the statistic about parents and the, the number of words children have heard. And so there could be that there's just, you purchase more things and those educational related purchases help your child. Not as often discussed, but not, the more I'm in public health spaces, the, I'm increasingly thinking about the ways in which what's also outside your home is also stratified by income. And so income might allow you to purchase a home in a better or quote unquote more higher quality neighborhood. And we increasingly are able to see with better um, GIS information and so forth that the location of say industry related or polluting industries and the absence of trees uh, is very much stratified and the air pollution is much higher in uh, lower income and poverty neighborhoods. And that air pollution could kind of affect your developmental process, right? So it could be not just in your home, but outside. There's also family scholars pay attention to the ways in which income might mitigate or reduce uh, financial strain. And financial strain is frankly really a hardship for your relationship, right? So if you feel uh, financial strain, you're more likely to enter into arguments to, uh, with both spouses and children, you may have less time and capacity in the sense that you're trying to meet your financial obligations and not be as present. And when present, not as, say, pleasant or encouraging or instructive with your own children. Uh, and so it could be a, a, a function of income could have a causal effect on children's adolescent, I mean, sorry, youth and adolescent later development in the sense that they're better able to parent without financial strains. But uh, I was trained as a pretty good skeptic. And so I'm not really sure that family income is not just a, a, a easier, possibly, even though it's a complex measure, a uh, way of picking up a whole host of other uh, unmeasured factors, whether it's from um, say conscientiousness, one of the big five personality traits or any other factor, there could be lots of things that income is a signal of. And we typically have, diff or even it could be a, a function of other say um, hardships or travails experienced uh, when that parent was a child, right? Uh, child abuse or something else of that nature and we can't understand or know. And we often don't ask such questions even in our uh, very large surveys. So I'm not so sure it's a causal effect and that's in many ways what this project is trying to do is trying to understand is the effect of income have a causal, a, a plausibly exogenous shift in income. Do we see any movement on children's test scores? We good so far? Okay, cool. All right, so I'm not the first to try this and I'm not the first that thinks this is interesting. There's been several other uh, quasi-experimental research designs. And what I mean by quasi-experimental research, for those who may not be as familiar with this phrase, is that I'm not simply taking cross-sectional data um, and looking at that association at point, um, you know, at the same time point or even longitudinally over time. What I'm trying to do and what others try to do is take advantage of what would be called exogenous shifts, meaning something external to the person uh, something that's outside of their own control, that then can we see that creates a change in income and does that then lead to changes in test scores? So we do see with studies that look at say unemployment losses. So a lot of this work was done by Liz Ananat and they're looking in North Carolina at plant closures and then looking at the plant closures and, the, and how that was structured because it was, North Carolina historically had a lot of textile bills and when those closures happened was sort of uh, spatially organized and they could look at you know, when those closures happen and unemployment uh, increased, income declined, then what happened to test scores? And they do see that as uh, income losses uh, were felt, that uh, lo loss due to unemployment, achievement, test scores for children declined. Um, but I've been around enough economists, so this is funny, I'm, I hope I don't misrepresent them. I've been around economists enough to know though that the, uh, the effects of income gains may not be symmetric to the effect of income losses, right? And so getting money may not mean the same thing as losing money. So most of the studies are about income losses. Uh, and so, but there's a remaining question. We are able to use the EITC. So for those not familiar, this is our largest anti-poverty program. Uh, it is a, bless you, or something. Um, it is a program where it's, you need to be in the labor force to receive the sort of tax deduction. And you can even, um, receive a credit from the federal government. Over the years, the federal government has shifted the rules and the policies for EITC such that different people can become eligible for different conditions, like how many kids and like how much you get for different children. The amount of the money has shifted over time. And so they've leveraged this shift in the EITC 
to understand then how children's test scores change. The challenges is you have to be low income to receive the EITC. So really these studies are, what is the effect of income gains on initially low income people? Which is a great and frankly, probably a really interesting and important policy question. Um, but it does mean we don't know as much about sort of income, uh, the effect of income gains across the income distribution and what would it matter for more, maybe more affluent children. So my research questions, uh, in short, is there a causal effect of family income gains on children's academic achievement? But I'm also a really good trained sociologist, and I don't think the effect is necessarily stable or constant. So I imagine that the causal effect is actually heterogeneous, meaning I think it works differently for different people. And so what I'm thinking about that is possible, how does it differ across children's developmental stage, younger versus older children, which here we'll uh, use grade level for uh, proxy. Uh, it might vary by uh, mathematics versus English language use. It also could vary by gender of the child, but here sadly we just have data on sex. And it can also matter by the initial social conditions of the, um, environment. Um, in other words, I'm looking for nonlinear relationships. Bless you. I'm going to walk through some of these um, ideas here to make sure that you understand where I'm coming from. So first, this one's actually kind of the easiest. How could the income effect differ by developmental stage, proxy by grade? A lot of research demonstrates that the, you know, a lot of early and young life interventions have dramatic long-term, even lifetime effects. Uh, so this is like studies from like the abecedarian programs and early Head Start and so on. We see these effects and they're greater than effects that are similar educational programs done in later ages. So my expectation is that the importance of the, uh, say the infusion of income would be stronger for younger children than older children, again, proxy by grade. Uh, so by subject matter, how could mathematics and English language arts, which, um, if you're not doing achievement data, that includes reading, writing, and sort of a comprehension that often requires them to write within the exam what their interpretation is. Uh, here, um, the literature might be less, I don't know, solid, if you will. Uh, we could imagine that mathematics might be more responsive to a new input, meaning it'd be more amenable to this shift to change. Um, the logic behind that is thinking that um, English language arts development is a, quite a complex skill, but essentially with each grade or each developmental stage, you're many ways reinforcing and building upon that skill, right? Uh, I have a fifth grader now. I mean, he's been learning how to talk about the action of a sentence and the action of the, the paragraph he's reading since first grade. It's just now in fifth grade, it's a messier paragraph he's reading, right? So that's kind of the logic here, that it's the same skill, but it's in its building and you need it across subjects. So it's certainly important, but mathematics and its growth, um, you learn new skills, right? So first you did math in the form of subtraction and addition, but then, whoa, they threw division and multiplication at you. And then there's fractions of all things. And the point is, is that you, with the minimal skill, there's a shift across mathematics. And, and, um, and while cumulative, it has uh, new inputs and new, like, new skill levels. It's also the case that um, we see in research that's already been done by Adenat that mathematics skills and this children's growth across time was more responsive to these economic losses, right? So when unemployment happens. So we have some empirical evidence that it's more responsive than English language arts. In contrast, um, reading is very much an activity that is often done in the home and parents contribute to the development of those skill sets. If this is an infusion of income into the family, that mechanism and that attention that's where the shift is occurring potentially, and we think of the mechanisms there, then families might shift their behavior and could then influence the child's reading skills. So my takeaway from this complex, but it's just my guess, um, I'm really though, I like prior research. So I went with prior research, uh, and, and my prediction is that the, in, the effect of income will be stronger for math versus English language. Okay, so good, on time. All right, by sex. Um, the gaps in mathematics and English language arts by sex are actually quite small, um, quite small. Um, yet, you have the added complexity that the gaps change across developmental stage. So I'm now getting messier. Uh, the world's a messy place. Um, so, and the 
pattern of the gaps changes in different ways for math versus English language arts, which is really kind of uh, fun or unfair, I'm not sure which. So English gaps by gender would initially favor girls. They narrow from K to five, but then expand from fifth to eighth. In contrast, <laughs> math gaps grow that initially favor boys. They grow from third uh, to fifth, but then narrow from fifth to eighth. Thanks. So um, I'm a little bit playing it safe. My expectation is that the income effect would be stronger for ELA for girls, and especially girls at older ages when we first um, when we watch them, and that the effects would be stronger for boys, particularly in math and at the uh, younger ages. Last set of complexities. By initial social conditions. So um, given the literature that shows that the uh, effect of the EITC was improving academic achievement for families from initially low-income families, this is sort of playing off of that or thinking about, okay, well, in a community, because I can't get family, which you'll see in a minute, I don't have individual level data on who has what money. But what I can note with small geographic spaces, the relative economic standing of those geographic units. And so my thinking first is about that uh, sort of income level or community level poverty. Um, and I've tried different ways of measuring this. Uh, and so we see, like I said before, that income gains do improve achievement along, among low income youth. Uh, but we also know from economics that the relative meaning value of income is greater for those that had less, right? It's not, um, that's part of why we log income when we measure it. So the marginal impact of income gains would be worth more uh, to people who have less and therefore worth more in places with more deprivation. So I have a prediction that the relative value of the income for changing the test scores would be stronger in the low income communities. I happened upon this conversation on rural and urban in part because I'm surrounded by amazing and phenomenal rural sociologists at Penn State. But it's also the case that my study site has a mix of urban to rural spaces. And I've been reading increasingly in the literature about say the opioid crisis and so forth and thinking about the relative and historical differences across rural and urban spaces. Um, and so we know from the literature that in rural areas, high school and college completion rates are lower but it's also the case that the returns to a college degree are lower, meaning the wage that you receive after getting a college degree is lower in a more rural community than an urban community. So the value of education has not been historically as supported in those spaces. We also know from a lot of literature that rural spaces have been undergoing tremendous industrial transformation. Yeah, so there's been a commercial and industrialization of farming. Uh, many places of manufacturing that used to be in rural spaces have left. And so there's been this industrial reshifting and important population decline, meaning often the youth that have the most options and opportunities after receiving the degree don't stay, but leave the community, leaving to a pretty select group of people in the community. Um, and the last piece of this that I have started paying attention to because of a different project that I'm happy to talk about, but it's about fertility. And in that paper, I need to look really closely at thinking about um, gender norms and gendered structures and how the labor market works and resources by gender. And through that process, I learned it's highly correlated <laughs> with the urbanicity. Like the more urban the place, the more gender egalitarian the social and community supports are. And the more rural the space is, the more uh, uh, traditional gender roles are supported and, and advocated, whether it's through church or politics or uh, the local labor market. So we see uh, from my own work that's hopefully going to come out, um, that rural areas have greater support for traditional gender roles. And this is where it comes in for test scores. The gender achievement caps um, are larger in places that have more traditional gender norms, meaning the, say, advantage for boys in mathematics is greater in places that traditionally support or support traditional gender roles, whereas smaller in places that are more egalitarian. So my expectation was that the effect of income will be stronger in these rural spaces. I'm gonna pause two seconds to see if I got everyone okay. Okay, all right. I might get messier soon, so <laughs> let me know. Uh, I became a mini economist along the way. Um, I really am interdisciplinary <laughs> uh, in some spaces. All right, so what we do to get to this causal question is to exploit the development of the Marcellus Shale development. And this is a picture I took in a very rural space, um, and that's the oil rig. 
So what you may not know, you've heard about fracking, but what you may not know is the reason fracking is really important is that it is the Marcellus Shield is the second largest gas field in the entire world behind Russia. There's actually a larger shale beneath the Marcellus that they're, they're already starting to develop called the Utica and expected to even be more profitable. Um, it's a lot of gas that historically was not accessible, meaning if you did drill the traditional well, it wasn't product, it wasn't um, economically feasible for them to make money off of the traditional wells. So what you'll see in my slide, sometimes it'll say unconventional well, and um, that I'll tell you what that means in a moment. It's a lot of gas. It could cover and cover the heating costs of the Northeast of the United States for years of the amount of gas that's in this. And it's a tremendous uh, value to the economy and, and a large investment. Um, oil and gas companies have invested trillions of dollars in Pennsylvania. <laughs> in the recent years. In other words, it's larger than any policy innovation we would ever try, right? The business sector did this, not the government. But as I mentioned, these, uh, this gas was really had no economic value because it's, um, so if I was a geologist, so I also learned about rocks. So if I was a geologist and cool, I'd bring you a rock. And what I'd show you is the rock is black and it looks like a hockey puck. You would not think there's any air, any pockets in this rock. It's not visible to the human eye. That's why it had no value because you really have to do is you have, and if this is the, the two pieces that made this profitable. So a traditional well just goes straight down. But the two innovations were that were important was what first is horizontal drilling. So after they go down, they go way, way far. The other thing we do is the fracking business where what they're trying to do is mostly with water, but with a ton of chemicals, they also like shoot into and they fissure tiny, almost imperceptible cracks in that hockey puck. And that releases the gas that's then collected in, uh, at the top of the wellhead. So without those innovations, which occurred in 2005, this wouldn't be done. So the first well was drilled in Southwestern Pennsylvania, uh, south of Pittsburgh in 2005. And the pace of drilling increased in 2008 when a geologist at Penn State realized how much, like he uh, like figured out that the estimate of how much gas was in there was about 10 times what they originally expected. So then they're like, oh my God, <laughs> there's more? And they're like, yeah, so then they all ran in. Uh, so then we have this room, and I'm happy to talk more and I have pictures about this. Um, for me, and I think for humans living in Pennsylvania, not the oil and gas industry, the boom was really 2010 to 2011. You have this increase in the number of wells being drilled. And at the time, though, the, um, the way they did the drilling, it takes, uh, I used to have the math, it, had, it took billions of gallons of water per well. And the way they did it in the initial phases of drilling was they trucked all of that in and they trucked it all out we were we did qualitative interviews in 2010 in different communities with different levels of shale development and the, and we went to different like we called them um, community leader e. we went to community sites where we thought they'd be worried or interested in what's happening with shale we talked to a school principal and he's like i'm going to get a commercial driver's license i'm going to go truck this water it was going to be a better paying job and with real resources so a lot of people uh and so but by 2000 11, the state required them to recycle the water, which meant they made little giant ponds uh, si bigger than football fields, but that's no trucking of water. So the labor market shift changed dramatically after that time. So the boom really is for humans, not the oil and gas company, <laughs> 2010, 2011. So there's two ways you get money out of the shale as a development. First, if you own the mineral rights to your property, it means you don't just own the surface rights, you own everything of that uh, that's from underneath your property. And so uh, they sign leases uh, with leasing bonus payments. And then you also, in the process of signing your lease, you sign a contract for how much your royalty rate is. The minimum royalty rate in Pennsylvania is 13.5%, which for states is actually pretty high. Um, and so anytime the gas is sold from your beneath your property, you get a portion of the net um, so it's not the gross of the net sales, right? So they take out the price of how much it took to um, like send it to market. They, there's some uh, post cleanup process. There's the pipe. So, but after that, you get a proportion of the sales. So that's one way. And in fact, when I started this project, I thought it was the main way. In other words, I kind of had in my head the, the clamp it's from, <laughs> um, I'm blanking on the show, but you know, I had this idea of like, you got money off of the, what's under your ground. Beverly Hillbillies, thank you. I was like, it's going to be a new beverage, but if you don't under the mineral rights of your property, you don't, oops, you don't get the, that part of the money. 
the key thing that we got interested in as it moved forward is that this was a huge labor boom. Uh, wages increased and jobs increased. And jobs weren't really on the wells. Those are fancy people from Texas and Oklahoma that move with the rigs and they don't like, you don't mess with those people. Um, but, but all the construction work, the, um, the truck driving work, the manufacturing of facilities, they had temporary housing had to go up and every time the oil moved. There's also uh, more traditionally female jobs that had to help with food provision. Um, the men filled up the hotels and so all the cleaning services and all that. And then frankly, clothes cleaning became the thing because they had to learn how to clean greasy, yucky clothes and you didn't put it through your regular wash. So there's all kinds of increase and restaurants took off. So there's this huge shift because the men came to town <laughs> and the rigs came to town. So this is where the Marcellus exists. Um, notice it goes way beyond um, the state of Pennsylvania. I'm focused on Pennsylvania and I'm happy to say more in the Q&A because they want to make sure I cover enough. But honestly, if you don't get this part, the whole rest of it, the findings, like I need you to believe me. So I got to do this well. So um, it goes across other states. The reason why it's not good for me to look at other states so much is because this, I was telling, um, oh, I'm gonna blank on your name because I'm all excited. Thank you. Um, this is the map that makes this whole project possible. <laughs> Without this, the whole thing's dead on the water. So in 2005, a bunch of oil and gas company entrepreneurs in the state of Texas made this map, which you'll notice there's two colors, pink and gray. And literally in my lab, we talk about pink shale and gray shale. Um, in papers, we talk about economically productive shale and less economically productive shale. <laughs> what this is and why they care, the geologists outline this pink area and like, that's the money pit. That's where the good rock is. Meaning they said that this is gonna be the part that makes the most money. It's gonna, it, so it's thermo, uh, it has th different thermodynamic properties, wet gas versus dry gas, the density of the rock, the depth of the rock, in other words, a whole bunch of rock stuff that no one in this room cares about. In other words, super exogenous. It has nothing to do with surface, nothing about the population, nothing about the politics, nothing about ease of access. Are there roads to these places? Hell no, this is good rock. So for us, this is a great exogenous variation. Sure, there's rock everywhere, but the geologists already said, yeah, these, some of these are not so good. But notice most of the quote unquote good rock is the Pennsylvania. And that's why I have Pennsylvania data. There's not enough places they don't get enough places in other states. The next best place is uh, West Virginia, but I've learned a lot about West Virginia politics and uh, coal. It's not, the, the whole process works differently there because of politics that were in the 1800s. So Pennsylvania is my state. So the beauty of this project is that the intensity of how much income people could get was exogenous to the individuals and really based on location. Were you actually above anything pink or gray? Are you, and that's the 2005 map, are you above the pink versus the gray? All right. Um, and that's gonna be my comparison, pink versus gray. Core is what I'll call pink. That's the intensity of the shale. And then non-core. If you have a better phrase, I'm happy for it, but it's the pink is core. And then of course it's timing. Are you before or after this new crazy technological in innovation? And the other thing for me that helps me check my whole validity is there is this beautiful state above me that is physically beautiful in New York state that bans fracking. So I'm thinking that location matters for how much money you get. It should not matter in New York, right? Because you can't do it. All right, so I use geographic location and time to instrument for income. Those are the, and not, oh, let me do limitations then I'll explain what the heck I mean by an instrument. I do not, and this is need to be known right up front. I do not have income da data at the person or family level. I tried, I tried and get an R1 <laughs> twice and I, this thing kept moving. So I was like, fine, I'll just switch gears and I'll get different kind of data. Um, so I don't have individual income data. So I have to instead use income tax data from the state of Pennsylvania and the state of New York uh, organized by uh, school districts, okay? There's 500 or so school districts in Pennsylvania. 318 are above the Marcellus Shale. So my unit of analysis are school districts. So here's a map that my lovely uh, GIA specialist Joseph made. The boundaries, these little tiny things are school districts. The red dots are where the wells are. There are wells outside the uh, red, but you can see that the people weren't, like they're like, we're going to the pink. And so they put in more at the pink. And that's where the red dots are. But so we have now just instead of pink and gray, because I need to publish this in papers, 
this like darker gray is my pink core shale, lighter gray, non-core. So I have an individual theory, but Ariel loved data and all the problems that go with that. But I'm gonna be honest about it. All right, I also do not have demographic data on the children who take these tests and give me that information beyond their grade and sex. Hugely problematic. So I can't control for family and person level factors. And this area is limited in its demographic and uh, um, urbanicity variety. We do have Pittsburgh, Philly's down here, um, but you can see they kind of haven't, at this point, it was 2011, they hadn't totally gone all the way into the middle of P Pittsburgh. There's discussion about when and where, where they will, uh, you know, but that's gonna be complicated. But they haven't, but it's near and all of the suburbs are certainly in the suburbs around Pittsburgh. All right. So it's a largely non-Hispanic white sample. All right, instrumental variables. How many people feel that word makes sense to them? Okay, just curious. All right, so the problem is, is that income is correlated with unobserved traits of the family and the child. And so I don't have a good estimate of the money. So what I do is I first use the location above that pink, that core to predict income. And then from that prediction, meaning I say, well, okay, the, purport, like the predicted value of income, I use that to predict achievement scores. The difference in difference design is that I focus on that the boom occurred 2008, 2010, and I have data on these districts before on achievement and after the shale, I have it for those pink core districts and the non-core gray districts. So I do a difference in difference, meaning I subtract pre and post for each space and then subtract that difference. All right, there you go. Two LS models. <laughs> Okay. Um, so the main dependent variable is with no child left behind, states had to uh, assess students' uh, test scores annually uh, with a criterion reference assessment system for grades third through eighth grade. And oops, well, that's not what I meant. Oh, how funny it came back. Okay, cool, we'll go with that. And there's four levels, advanced, proficient, basic, and below basic. You want to be here. <laughs> um, I'm gonna briefly reference this given time, but Pennsylvania standards of advance, what the hell does that mean, right? Then like versus Minnesota, I couldn't tell you, right? I can't tell you how they translate. So a strategy would be to use those levels of advanced to below basic to translate into a meaningful metric that test score people know, and that's the NAEP test. So this is where Sean Reardon comes involved. I connect to his Stanford Education Data Archive, and he uses PSA da PSS data as well as states like, like other data from other states to basically try to make the equivalent of a NAEP norm score for every district in the United States. But note the years are for 08 and 09. My pre is before that. So uh, I'll skip that, but the, in essence, we have these levels and we're trying to get a continuous variable out of it. So it's like going backwards with an ordered probit. Okay. We have to make it ourselves for the pre. I had hoped to have the gendered scores today, but I only have the total because it's messier when you get to small sizes. Does it make sense? I have area income. I have test, uh, I have uh, tax data from both New York and Pennsylvania. I have information on like sort of these pre-existing initial traits before the shale boom that come from basically the census. I have demographic control variables I'm happy to talk more about. And I have information that I think, well, it might get messed up because the shale might've messed up some environmental or some other problems in the community. Okay, moving ahead. The results are actually kind of quick because you have to do all this work in the front end too. All right, to just to, the key thing, these are the NAEP scores, all students, because they don't have it separated by gender, and I have like a pre-post. So what you can see for math, uh, oh, that's supposed to say third grade. Oh, it doesn't say third grade, but this is third grade over here. Basically, you see across time, we're gonna go through your third grade, eighth grade, third graders uh, in 2012 tasted better, tested better, tasted, tested better than third graders in 2007. The gains were higher in math. The thing one would worry about is that do you, like you're comparing the gray and the pink. Are they big control or those weird places? 
right? Like, are they really different from you? So what this is helping me see is that no, the places that are above the core, meaning they have 50% of their land area above the core, so they're super pink, <laughs> relative to places that have over 50% of their land over area over that gray, non-core, this is in 2007 before the boom, and they look really dang similar in their test scores. I could also show you by control variables, really, really similar. So I have a good comparison group, which is key. All right, the next thing I have to, so you gotta believe me that I got a good start, but you also gotta believe me that my instrument really works. So this is gonna look at, these are, every cell on the table is going to be a different regression. And what I'm doing is, how much of your land is above pink? And then does that predict change in income? If it's working, I should have a positive and larger number. So if I look at all of the Pennsylvania shale districts, yes, income went up, especially earnings. Um, when I do the date, well, I'm gonna save that for later. Okay, then I would want it to work across areas. Um, this is not making me happy, but if I use different measures of poverty, I don't know. Okay, but it's, you can see really it's an earnings boom mostly. And it was in poor areas and rich areas. In other words, I'm not going to find an effect or not effect because there's no money. And the, uh, the boom occurred uh, primarily in earnings and across both rural and urban. My uh, placebo test, if you will, right? It shouldn't matter that you're above the core in New York because you can't frack. And that's exactly true. This is a non-significant association. If I use other measures of trying to do a placebo, they work as well. Okay. All right, moving fast. But the results, that was stage one. Now we're on to stage two. Okay, does it matter? Like I did like literally 40, all right, I'm at 45 now. Okay, so I'm wrapping up, which is good. 45 minutes to get to like and, <laughs> which frankly reflects the project itself. You do a ton of work to get to, ah. okay, so here we are. Um, does it matter? And for NAEP scores, no, no, not by grade, not by subject. Okay, well, but I stood up here already and said, I think it's nonlinear. There's differences across groups and blah, blah, blah. And I actually did believe that. I wasn't just saying this because I knew the results. I actually, these were run this week. So, hey, um, I mean like last week. Okay, because it's Monday. But what if so we think about proficiency scores that advance, proficient, basic, below basic, I'm paying attention to the top and the bottom. And I could move to tables or you could do words either way. But in essence, we see slight increases for English language and proficiency for all grades, all students in initially poor districts. There looks to be a small reduction below basic for boys. In pictures or numbers, I mean, this is the first finding the growth in proficient for those that were initially in modest income or in initially poor. And then we see this P.10 for uh, a reduction in below basic for all boys. When it comes to math, um, we see a modest increase in proficient, but still only P.10 for eighth grader boys, which was, I thought it'd be the, well, anyways. So I got the boy right. I got the math okay. I missed the age. Um, and there's a modest reduction in below basic. And this is, um, and there's a also a modest reduction for uh, boys in all districts. So this gets more, you can kind of see there's more stuff for math by having more charts. In other words, we have this uh, increase, this row is about proficiency and increase in proficiency for boys in math in eighth grade. And then we have this reduction for de depending on the combination, but you also notice the size of these coefficients are bigger than the ELA ones. They're still not happy, I'm not happy in the, statistically significant part of this, but I have small variance getting sliced, 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 but anyways, um, and it's, but it's mostly still boys. So uh, I did a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay, I'll just tell you more on that later. So my instrument works really well. Um, the identification structure works well. The exogenous income gains do not affect test scores overall or with that linear measure of the NAEP score. The income effect seems to be greater in reducing below basic. And the there are some signals, but not strong signals of heterogeneous results in the sense that the magnitudes are larger for math. And the results seem stronger for math for boys, and particularly under conditions of initial low economic uh, communities. Um, my last slide, 
well, that I plan to talk about. I have others if you need them. Um, these results are super sensitive and I'm unhappy because they like totally change depending on what I control for. I add controls, they shift. I take away controls, they shift. I am not happy. The demographer data scientist in me is like, I can't even talk about this. This does not make me happy. Um, but I am presenting to you, like I looked across it all. I gave you the most conservative results because at least you won't walk away with it. It's a big finding. Oh no. <laughs> I wanted to be more as ethically responsible as possible. Uh, it's hundred percent a work in progress. Um, and so I'm open to that consideration. And so this is the most frustrating thing to me right now. Super mad at it. Um, and I need to figure out why. Um, coming back to this again, trillions of dollars flowed into Pennsylvania. This was huge. Uh, and it, dramatic changes in employment, especially men's employment, especially men's who are high school educated or less. Like this was a very traditional job for traditional low educated men. And I had pretty weak income effects. <laughs> for the full population. I don't think my policy friends will be happy. Um, but I'll conclude by saying, I will keep working on it until I feel more confident and willing to submit the results. Thank you for your time. You guys were really quiet though. Oh, I heard I'm supposed to keep this, not give it to you, but repeat the question. Yes, down in front. Um, so time is a huge challenge for me um, because I have to get the boom right. So one of the reasons the results shift, actually, you can help me with this. Um, so there's, so, hmm, okay, how much do I want to say? Um, so I have the text data, right? And I have pre, pre ZZ. What to do with post? So um, even before I became besties with all the economists, I knew you need to average across income because it's super volatile, right? So the way the post income measure here is actually across two years, um, 2011 and 2012. The results shift if I use the boom where the post is 2010 and 2011. So it seems kind of sensitive of when we're measuring and picking up the peak money, but I can't decide. I wanted 2012 test scores and I thought, and so I'm curious about your thinking. In other words, I'm making the lag on the test scores zero. But if I move the income measurement to being average across 10, 2010 and 11, I can then shift and imagine different lags. But I need a stronger theoretical evidence for thinking that through versus me just saying, I'll change what my measure is. So I haven't done it yet, but it's probably thinking about what's the right timing. It is the case that we, it's historically most scholarship around exogenous shifts don't have a ton of time to pick up and notice what's shifting because a lot of other starts stuff shipping starts changing and shifting so lag effects in other papers i've done i get really good by the time it's done like i i kind of see when these occur and one of my challenges is trying to figure out exactly when the labor part i think what i really need to do is get dig into when the labor boom really is and think, well, did I answer your question? Oh, she, she asked about timing. Sorry, I didn't do that right. Okay, in the back, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, this is wonderful, and I have loved the research. Oh, cool. Cool. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, awesome. Okay, couple of first reactions. One, I have an entire other paper predicting fertility. Um, a, oh, the question, one of the questions is what about fertility and changes in fertility as a result of this process? Thanks, Stacey. Uh, and the, um, uh, that paper's a little bit further along um, and it does appear to have shifted fertility. The challenge is it's a different population. These are third graders. At, they're already in third grade at the time of the boom versus the fertility of people who could have 
they could already have children. Like their kids could be in this data, right? if it's a second or third or later child. Um, but uh, the fertility is pushing the, in, like, in, if you will, entry into this parenting style. Uh, it does look like it increased fertility for married people, particularly in places that were more gender traditional. It looks very much like we might understand Becker's predictions about fertility if we thought more about, oh, the context, like the, if, the, if the economists had talked to the sociologists <laughs> in the 70s, we'd be like, you got a labor boom going on with this, and this is not just income. And it does, and in that paper, I'm able to test the differences in the type of income. And because I use different places, I can see both a royalty gain and there's royalty gains if you use a different way of doing the sample, and there are and there are earnings gains, and I can test the relative role of each. And in this 2010 era, it's earnings not mailbox money or the royalty money that matters, which is the exact opposite of what Becca would have said. So I'm having a ton of fun with that paper. Um, thank you for asking. And um, the other questions though, we're thinking about lags and thinking about, but I got so excited, I may have missed it. So correct me if I go off track. Volatility. Volatility. So a uh, great question. And yes, yeah, so one of the things I think that's super important that I didn't have the chance to mention is this is coming right off the Great Recession. And in most of these communities, um, many of the people were um, suffering under the Great and when we were in the field, we, we asked them about the Great Recession and heard them and many of them frankly, hadn't been in poor economic conditions, especially if they're in rural spaces for a very long time. So for them, this was like a continuation. But for many, we know from other data, uh, the Great Recession for many led to increases in debt. So what I hear from you is, what is the income doing? And is it volatile? I can measure the gains, but I have an average level measure. So I won't put be able to predict or pick up within household change. My expectation is it is one part of maybe a curve in the sense that we might be coming off great recession challenges and employment challenges. We had lots of people talking about how they lost their job in the recession. Um, so we may be coming in an upswing, but I may be not be picking up the downturn. And um, because I don't have family level data, I can't follow that. Um, but it is important that I also think maybe the income, like I didn't talk about this, but what is the income used for? A strong suspicion I have based on the data and because we asked people, what would you do with this money? Um, many of them would pay down debts. So then the question becomes, well, how and when does paying down debts matter for children's education? Well, I do think it goes back to that strain model and how good a parent they can be. But it's probably unlikely that they're buying the books. They did some bought ATVs. Uh, I think Claire was next. Excellent. Um, to repeat, she uh, for those on Zoom, um, one question or concern is that ELA scores are correlated with math. Yes, you're building. You have to have ELA scores to do math, um, and I have them completely independent, dependent variables. Correct. Um, 
the next question is, could, if you think money might help a family by navigating relationships, could money actually, it seems like that would be like path dependent based on your conflict style or other knowledge and relationship history and may actually per, uh, lead to divorce. Yes, that's one of the outcomes later um, is like single parenthood. So, um, but I'm not there yet. Um, I'm having fun, but the key thing is I need to do them each well, right? I need, e I need y'all to believe one, so I get to get deep into each dependent variable, so it takes a little bit of time, sorry. So that one's going to take a while. It's at the end of the list, um, but it's like a homecoming. But you're right, like the Palomata world would say, well, it depends, was there a previous conflict or not, whether or not that divorce would be positive or not. Okay, back to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is interesting. Um, so you have to look for like what else is going on in the world. So I did talk to some district level experts to understand, like, is there any other policy shifts? I double checked, like, did they change the test? Um, the thing I did find is there was a huge scandal in 2012 and later uh, where educators, particularly in Philly, so they're not in my data, thank God, but it is also in, um, there's a couple districts in Pittsburgh where basically after they started learning that these test scores were important for the state, districts started literally changing students' answers. And now they got prosecuted. Okay, so I have for future analysis to start flagging which districts had like bad actors. Um, but you're totally right in the sense that Pittsburgh is a little bit messy. Um, and I can just pull those really, really, really urban like Pittsburgh out. Um, the other piece to that is um, it is the case, like I said, these things are flexible. These models are not so stable. If I had given you more, um, like to try to have p-values of 0.05, the results do look strong in urban versus rural spaces, which was not what I predicted. And so the other reason we're not, like I need to understand what's going on. 